Live from Brooklyn, welcome to The Sick Podcast, starring Alan Stein, where he steers your career with Kadima. I'm Russ Reba, along with your host, Alan Stein. Alan, you know what time it is, don't you? It's time for the jam session. It's jam session time. So tell the listeners, tell your audience a little bit about what jam sessions are. So as you know, Russ, I love the acronyms. And jam session stands for job acquisition method. And what these jam sessions are, are just a straight shooting, no holds barred conversation about the real truth and honesty about how to get great jobs at the world's best tech companies. And we're breaking these sessions up into different themes. Today's theme is all about the application process. All right, so with that, we'll get things started with this question. How long does the recruitment process take, would you say, on average? Which software tech companies have the most effective or the fastest processes? They all suck. Some of them could be really fast. Some of them can be really slow. On average, it really depends on your level. It really depends on a lot of things. I tell people typically to assume three to six months from the start of your proactive job search to actually getting that offer that you want. Three to six months in general can be faster. I've gotten people jobs in five weeks. It's taken nine months for some people. It really depends on what your BAFNA is, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. If you're unemployed, you might just take anything that comes along. If you have a decent gig, you might be a little bit more particular, so you might turn some things down. So it really depends, but three to six months on average. And in terms of which companies have the most effective processes, they all kind of suck. Uh, Amazon is good. They're a machine because they hire so many people. Google is a machine. Facebook is a machine in terms of hiring. But you will get lost in the shuffle because your recruiter is not just hiring you and not just dealing with you, but they often have 20 roles that they're supporting or 10 to 20 roles that they're supporting. In each of those roles, they're talking to five to 10 candidates. So they have all these different balls in the air simultaneously. And you don't know if your role is a high prior role for them or a low prior. You don't know if the hiring manager is pounding the pavement to hire this quick or they're twiddling their thumbs. So there's so much deviation there. That's hard to say. And that's why our Kadima method teaches you to really cast a wide net with those 40 companies then build out a network at those companies, then search and apply and get lots of opportunities out there. Because when you're interviewing for a company, realize that they're talking to nine other people. When you get to the very end, they're still talking to three or four other people. So why should you not be talking to nine, 10, 20 other opportunities? You're putting yourself at disservice if you don't cast a wide net. And if you put your, all your eggs in one basket, you know it's gonna get crushed. It might work out, but it very most likely will not. All right, so Alan, what advice would you give if I asked the question, how do I know what level of role to apply for? So generally, what I suggest for people as guidance is look at years of experience. And depending on the company, if you see 10 plus years of experience at Google, it's really like 15 years of experience at other companies or like Facebook or Salesforce or Microsoft. Uh, Those are minimums. So look at the years of experience, although some applications are trying to take off the years of experience to make it more culturally diverse. I think it actually makes it more confusing. There are some websites that share different levels, like if you go to levels.fyi or candor.io, I would look at years of experience. And then in terms of roles and how to know which role and companies to target, roles to target, look at the job description and look at what's required there. It's not always clear. But the roles that I typically focus on are the two thirds of the roles in the companies that are not engineering. So you think about Google, you think about Amazon, you think about Facebook as engineering companies. Google has 160,000 employees now, I think. About two thirds of them are not engineers. There could be sales or finance or operations or sales operations or customer success. So there's tons of roles there that are very analogous to roles if you're coming from Discover or you're coming from Procter & Gamble or you're coming from Unilever. All right. When we're talking about open positions uh, over over the course of time, what are the best times of the year to apply? It's another good question. Whenever the job is out there, there is some seasonality 
with job postings in the tech industry and many industries. In the tech industry, budgeting, forecasting, and planning often occur in September, October timeframe, planning for the future year's forecasted headcount. And at that time in September, or October, then headcount is divvied out to all the leaders across the organizations. And then October, November, December, roles start being issued and opened up. So you will see an influx of opportunities near the tail end of the year going into the first couple of months of the year. So you will see generally a peak of opportunities in October, November, December, into January or February. But honestly, whenever roles are available on the site, you want to be there quickly. And again, within the first week or two of that role posting, because if you don't get in there within those first couple of weeks, the cart has left the stable and you are going to be shit out of luck and not considered for one of these great opportunities. That's it's interesting. Very good information. Now, should we apply quickly first and then reach out to our network? Because sometimes it takes a little time for the person to respond. Great question. Ideally, you get a referral, but the referral may not get back to you. So generally what I advise people to do is reach out if they have a really strong booster at the company and they reach out to their buddy, um, Eddie at Twilio and say, Hey, Eddie, I see this role that just opened up. You probably have Eddie's cell number and you can text them and you'll probably get a quick response. That's great. But if you're on the fence, if, if maybe Kelly is going to respond to you at Amazon, you can say, Hey, Kelly, I see this great role here. I plan to apply for it by end of day tomorrow. Do you know anything about the role or the team? So that gives her the indication that if she's interested in helping you, and a lot of these companies give you referral bonuses for the employees, that then she knows that you're giving her 24 hours and you don't need to make it in a, a mean way, but you don't want to be waiting on Kelly to get back to you before applying for the role. So referral is definitely best, but if not a referral, get your application in there quickly. So that begs the question, since a candidate is going to approach the same company multiple times, let's say based on funnel realities, do referrals help on each submission or just the first role? They help on each role. And there are different type of referrals that you can have. When all these companies get referrals, I've gotten asked for so many referrals at Salesforce, at Facebook, at Google, at Tableau, the American Express a little bit. But especially at Google and Salesforce and Facebook, they would have a drop down box of what sort of referral is this guy, James? Did you work with him? Do you know him personally? Or is it just a courtesy referral? And you're looking for people that will be advocates for you, that can vouch for you, that can say something nice about you. So you want those referrals to be stronger than just a obligate referral. And if you have an opportunity to get referred into a role, leverage that referral, especially if they're an advocate and especially if they think that you are a good fit for that role because they're a good booster and they'll give you honest feedback of, hey, this is the right role, the right level for you to apply for, get that referral in there. And if they are a true booster, not only will they submit it in the system or they'll give you a link to apply for the role, but they will reach out internally to the hiring manager of saying, hey, I know this guy, James, he's super sharp, his technical acumen, he's a big public speaker, you should talk to him. And that will often get you the recruiter screen, which gets you in the process. So yes, leverage the referral as often as you can. But don't abuse that referral relationship. Do not abuse that relationship you have with that advocate. Now, I'd love for you to talk about follow-up tempo. What, what's energetic and serious or enthusiastic about the company and, and the role? And what is too lax and what's too annoying? So there's not a clear-cut answer for this because different people have different thresholds for updates and follow-up. I can tell you for me personally, I always appreciated people that would follow up and in a respectful and patient manner. So typically what I try to advise my clients is at the end of your interview, it's always a fine question to say, I'm excited about the role. What are next steps in timing? 
and they will often tell you something. They may say, I don't know, you got to speak to the recruiter, but often they will know. And they'll say, hey, we'll get back to you by next Tuesday. You put down on your calendar, next Tuesday is March 15th. I typically will follow up the next, hopefully you'll get called before, or you'll get notified before March 15th. But I put a reminder on my calendar for March 16th, if I do not hear back, say, hey, I'm just following up. I know you mentioned that you'd follow up with me on March 15th. I'm so excited about the role and just wanted to get an update on the process. Totally fine. There's another guy, Steve Dalton, who writes a two-hour job search who says to follow up a day before. I personally think that's a little pushy, but I, there's no research on that. So a day before, a day after, totally fine. I think people appreciate that. What's energetic and serious and enthusiastic about the company and role and what's too lax? It's always good to act energized. It's always good to make the company think that they're your number one choice. Even if they're not, you don't need to tell them that. They're always making you seem like you're their number one choice, and they're talking to four or five other candidates. So you do the same to them. You want to influence them. You want to make them aware that you like them, which will often mean that they will like you. So you use influencing techniques, reciprocity of treating them nice, and they'll treat you nice. Doesn't mean it's going to result in the job, but it will increase the likelihood that you will get on and on to the different stages and ultimately get an offer. All right. Well, that's another Jam Sessions episode in the books. Thank you for that, Alan. And thank you for listening to the SICK Podcast. Do you see how Alan can steer your career with Kadima? I want you to log on to sickpodcast.com. That's S-Y-C-K podcast.com. Leave an audio message for Alan. We may even play it on an upcoming show. We hope you've enjoyed the episode and you are going to love the next one.